Great to see so many people and so many familiar faces now that I've been here several days. That's, that's really great. It's good to be here. Um, this talk is about business value over architecture. And I will, during the talk, also kind of tell you what's the history of that talk, really. Um, yeah, you see how my contact information the slides are actually already up, and you should get them through the website and the app. And, um, well, for the ones who have been here yesterday in the panel, they also know some stuff maybe about me. And I see these are not really good. But, well, these are the books that I wrote. So one of my focus is on scaling Agile. So I actually wrote the very first book on that subject matter in 2004, so really long ago. Then also on distributed teams and then retrospectives for organizational change and cost of delay is uh, another topic that I wrote on. However, this is all not really the topic for today. Well, the thing that probably relates most with are the, the ones on scaling on and on distributed. So the thing is, if you are working on a system in an agile way, um, you, well, you have some architecture in place. And Bear with me, it's a really simple architecture that I used here. It's more like a placeholder that it reminds you, well, there is an architecture for the products we are building for the systems, right? So it could be like this, so we have some user interface, some business logic, and then there is a server part to that, right? Now, if you work in an agile way, the Main difference is that you're not working like you start with the back end, then the business logic, and then the UI. And also, if the architecture would be more complicated, you wouldn't start like layer-wise implementing what you want to do, right? We, I think that's what we all learned in whatever, Scrum School or anywhere. Um, so this means for a team to really create a product, it always focuses like on slices through the whole system. We agree on that. Okay, now one of the things might be, and it might already start with one team, but I think it get even, gets even more difficult if you work with several teams. So given we have several teams now in place, and those several teams, want to work on the system. So what we are doing, because we all learned that, we slice our system through this way, right? So every team might focus on a specific area, and they all have the slice through the whole architecture, which also means once we, when we start working on the system, we start with a very, very tiny slice, which is often very hard to find. Right? So the stories also should go through and they should cover the whole architecture and be, create the architecture bit by bit, if you will. And the reason for that, I think, is also what we all learned. It's, well, we want to create business value. That's the focus of all we are doing. So we want to create the business value as early as possible, and that's also how the product owner is steering the team in that direction that we have that business value soon enough. Um, the other thing is that by having those slices, we also can get really good feedback on what we are doing. If we would focus like layer-wise, the feedback we are getting, well, is for a long, long time only technically. So we will never know really what the users are saying with that, what the stakeholders think about this. Also, integration is kind of a non-issue at that point when we go layer-wise. So it's really getting really good feedback that helps us to create a better product. Um, the, the last thing, which is also very important, is by doing it this way, we want to create earlier return on investment. So even if we are not done with the whole product, we might be able to sell the product once we have like that slice done, right? So it might be the case that we can actually sell what we are having after three months or maybe even earlier, but, and we don't have to wait all the, whatever, say five years if it's really a big product till we are done with everything. So that's also what we all hope that Agile really brings us. So, and hmm, 
Maybe I also have to put it in the other way around because sometimes people think that Agile makes us faster. And maybe it does, but I think the main thing it really does, it gives us that opportunity to go to the market faster. So building the whole stuff might take the same amount of time, but going to the market will be faster. Okay, so I think we all agreed on this, kind of. At least I see some people kind of in agreement, or I take it for agreement. Now the thing is, what happens to me when I work with my clients that every once in a while people ask me, okay, now, now so these are my clients, so what about the architecture? And I give the typical consultant the answer, well, it depends, right? So this is the answer we all love the most, because it's always true. And it really depends. And now this is kind of now the history of this talk in a, in a short way. It, I thought I really want to get a grip on what does it depend on. So I wanted to explain what are all those things that coming together that drive the architecture in a, a specific way or that help us to support and maintain or build the architecture, really, and not losing focus of things like conceptual integrity or so, just because we are focusing on business value only. Because if we are only focusing on business value, well, maybe there comes a time where we are not able to do that anymore because the architecture is a complete mess. Yeah, And I guess some people have seen it and others might have feared it. So. Now, coming to the point, what does it depend on, really? The first axis I want to look at, well, the, the one thing that I always say, well, it depends on the complexity. Now, complexity is still something that's not really, that you can't get your hands on, really. So what does it really mean that something is complex? So the one thing that I look at when I look at complexity in that sense here is, uh, that's the y-axis. What is our rate of changes that we are seeing? So down here, in case you can't read it in the back, down here it's we have only a few changes in our system or we have many changes in our system. So this is one way of looking at it. And then on the x-axis, we have the uncertainty. So low uncertainty or high uncertainty, which means, well, are we creating something with a technology we, we have never seen and we are really uncertain about that and we don't really know what to do with it? So we also need to run some maybe proof of concepts, experiments, whatever. Or we are using that for a long, long time so it's a no-brainer for us working with that stuff because that's what we used to do. And similarly with the rate of changes, is this something where we will get and maybe also expect a lot of changes because maybe uh, it could be from the architecture side, but it could also be from the business side that the customer doesn't really know what he wants. Well, this is how we know our customers anyway, right? And so they explore with us the possibility of the product and therefore with those changes, the product will evolve. And the more changes we see, the well, they will have an influence. And what kind of influence? I want to look at this now. So remember, we had those teams that were focusing on the business value, right? So this is how we started with. And now when we look at, now from the technical point of view or the sy systemic point of view of what we are building, the product, then we see that in this lower corner, meaning we only have a few changes and we are quite certain about the technology we are using, then we can talk about a system that's pretty stable, it's not really complex. Very often it's also a, a system that we are maintaining, right? So it's just we, we know most of it and there comes a change every once in a while and so that's fine. Then at the other extreme, so we don't really know what we are using here, we have to learn as we go and also the customer learns with us which means the system we are building is highly complex and pretty unstable because of the changes, because of our learning that's going on, and so this is where we are. And then there's this big field in between, which is called adapting. Now, 
again, my question was at the beginning, well, how do we support the architecture? Now we are getting really there. It depends in which area we are in. This leads us into how we can create, support, maintain the architecture. And, um, well, this, bill, this picture will get over by more and more complex <laughs> as well, or maybe confusing even. So if we stick with the um, left lower corner, so we have a stable and complex area, so we know what we are doing, few changes and so on. So there are typical two ways of, if we are working, especially with small teams, two ways of how we create, maintain, well, most often it's more maintaining thing, the architecture. And the two ways are having a chief architect who's kind of knowing where we are heading and ensuring that whatever we are doing is not breaking stuff, or we have a community of practice. So this can look like this. So the chief architect, we have our three teams. That was the example how I started. The chief architect ensure that the, whatever those different feature teams are doing it's not conflicting, not breaking the system, that we are still coherent, conceptual integrity is still there in the system and all of that. So advising on what's going on. The other possibility, as I mentioned, is the community of practice. And the community of practice just means that from every business or feature team, we have like one person and it, can, it must not be the same one all the time. It's just, you could also say, like, in this sprint, it's whoever who has the head on that. And one person responsible for architectural or technological issues. And so they kind of get together every once in a while when there is, for example, a change that we need to make or if there is um, some uncertainty in the technology that we are seeing here, and then they are getting together and figure out how to solve that, and then it will be solved in the respective teams. Maybe all of them, maybe it's only um, one team that's impacted by that. Clear so far? So these are two possibilities wh which I see in like stable, uncomplex environments. And if you're working with one team only, even then, it could mean like you have one of the guys um, that would be the, con the maybe the chief architect, or you have like uh, roles that are passed through that, that are rotating, but you have like people having a head on it. So that's a, a typical thing at least. Okay, so then we are looking at the other extreme. Now, we are looking at the extreme where it's absolutely unstable, highly complex, meaning we have a lot of changes and we don't really understand the technology much. So the thing that I found, especially in, in large and maybe also distributed settings, is um, that it's most helpful to have something that I like to call a technical service team. And the thing that I find really important is service. And the thing how this works is basically like that. So we have still our three teams here, and those three teams, they formulate their, well, you could also say stories or requests they are having towards the architecture. And those stories or requests are coming based on the features they are developing. So remember, they were like, looking at their slice through the system. They are driven by the product owners creating, product owner to create as um, high a business value as possible, all of that. And then they figure, well, in order to create that business value, we need X from the architecture because it doesn't support that, right? And so they are basically filling a product backlog, or you could also say just a backlog without product, more a technical backlog, for that team that's called, and that's the one up there, the upper right corner, for the team that I call a technical service team. And I, I mentioned already that I think the service is really the important thing because some people might have seen that before, maybe also in the old world, and that was what has been called an architecture team. Well, the way I saw architectural teams in like the classic world, they were more sitting on an ivory tower and thinking about 
some kind of weird concepts and throwing it to the diverse teams and they had to adhere to those concepts and they rolled their eyes and were saying, well, this is not helping us. We are not getting anywhere and it slows us down and, and all of that. So here it's, on the one hand, really the other way around because that technical service team provides a service to all the feature teams. So it's more the feature teams driving what that technical service team is doing and not as it was kind of in the old world where the architectural team drove what the like business features, whatever teams were doing, right? So it's upside down. And it's clearly that those uh, feature teams are, well, filling the backlog and prioritizing that. And there are then, again, also a, a few things you can think of. So sometimes if it's more like a small setting, like these three, maybe it's good enough just the way I have scribbled it here um, that they get together and decide on the priorities, but maybe you really want to have also a, an equivalent as a product owner for the technical service team, which would be somebody, the feature teams, trusting because that should be a person making the decisions on the backlog in the way they really need it the most, right? So they, yeah. They are actually, if you put it that way, the feature teams are actually the customers of that technical service team. Make sense? Okay. Um, time is passing really quickly. And then we have adapting. Um, that's the last part. It's the technical consulting team, that what I call there, and it really is something that sits in between. And really just like that. So technical consulting team, team means, well, you have more or less a pool of people, and yeah, a pool of people, and those people are supporting the respective feature teams as needed. So if, for example, this team up there, uh, well, in this picture I use that team down there, but you don't see it that good, so I'm still, I'm using this team here. Uh, figures that we really need support in terms of the architecture because we are like in an uncertain field where we don't really know what's going on. So then for a given sprint, somebody is working with the team on that issue. So they are also developing, so just like a regular whatever developer, but they are also mentoring the whole team that they understand what's going on there and ensuring the coherence of that. So that's the the intermediate state here, so the technical consulting team. And now, I said this picture gets messier or more confusing maybe over time or more complex, I said. So the thing that I'm seeing very often, this is something that's related to time as well. Because when you are starting a new product, very often things are fussy and you might really explore also a new technology and you are exploring the business together with the customers. So you are in this upper right corner and things are really complex, chaotic, and you are like constantly changing things. So there you might have the need of the technical service team. But then when things are moving forward and smoothing down, well, the uncertainty gets less, the changes get fewer, well, and you, you can know what kind of changes are coming, you can handle it much better. Then sometimes it's the case that the technical service team, or some of them, turn into the technical consulting team, so being that pool for the different teams. And then times passing further, then you are in the stable world and you might have, well, none of kind of the architects anymore because you, they all got into, incorporated in those different feature teams and so you have only, only in quotes, a community of practice and that's wonderful. Or maybe you decide, well, in our case, it would be good to have a chief architect because you have across different products, you want to have like a product line and so they are cooperating with other architects from other products, whatever. So that that maybe again a depends thing, right? So what's your decision on chief architect or um, uh, the community of practice? So that's that's really the m messy thing, and it is um, my answer. 
to this, what, I, what do I mean if I say, well, creating and supporting the architecture depends, and well, then it looks like that. You have all those different options, and there is not a one thing that's true. There's just something, where are we at with our system? And sometimes what might be helpful is, maybe you want to do with the rate of changes in uncertainty. I've done that also, like putting it on the floor, and people stand where they think they are with the system, and that might tell you something, how you should set up the way you are working here, in order to still be able to deliver the business value, because that's still the most important thing. But if the architecture is not supporting it, we can't do this anymore. So it, it, still has the same motivation as before, but we need some support for the architecture. And I think I am out of time here, and I'm done. So thank you very much. And um, yeah, I have like of my two books over there, I have a discount on Lean Pub if you have that link with actual India, so maybe if you're interested. So thank you. I'm not sure, I guess we don't have time for questions, I guess. Well, yeah, it's lunch, but we, people are hungry. You have a question, yeah. Yeah. Ah, so how do we ensure that the, the technical ser service team also adheres to a timeline? Actually, the way we are setting it up always, it's they're running in the same rhythm. So they also have a sprint. They commit to what the, um, their clients are asking them, which are the feature teams. And they are really, we are doing it just the same way. It's only their clients are, if you will, more technical. It's not like the end customers, stakeholders, anything like that, but it's the feature teams. Yeah. Yeah. So how do we, in an unstable world, how do we do what? Ah, ah, so, okay, so the thing is that the feature teams request that they need this and that in order to implement their stories, and so the technical service team has to figure out what to do in that case, and so the thing is, sometimes they can't just start doing it, sometimes it's more, at least that's, again, that's my favorite approach, I, I then advise them more to look for a time box that they experiment with something, then report back, and if it's working, maybe it's the right way, and, they, and if not, they run the next experiment. But we time box how long we are experimenting with something. It's um, actually in the good old, I think, XP world, that was also something that has been called a spike. So where we just, or, well, in the old world, on the other hand, waterfall, you would call it probably more proof of concept or something. So just like that, but time box it, because otherwise people will explore forever. Yeah, right, good question. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thanks.